close to 80 or 90 uh, roundtable events in our nine years. Um, and this is the first one that is focused on housing and affordable housing specifically. And so it's an exciting um, new area. We've been covering, obviously, the issue for a long time, but um, to do an event around it and, and bring folks together is uh, a, a really um, important step for us, and, and we're proud to do it. Um, because this is a new crowd, you may not have heard my spiel on these things before, so I'm going to subject you and those who have uh, just for a couple minutes. But these events are really important to, uh, I think, certainly to NJ Spotlight's mission in New Jersey, but I think to the state as well. Um, we, we get folks uh, chattering away and reading online and, and the like, and, and I think it's important to get them all in the same room as well and, and, and talk to each other and have exchanges face-to-face. -face. Uh, some of that gets lost in this modern world, and so I think uh, we, we try to help fill, fill the gap there, but, but obviously those conversations are happening uh, out there, and we hope to continue them as well. Um, one of the beauties of these events, too, is that, um, as you will see, there's a, a camera here. We are, we are now in a new marriage with NJTV News, um, and they are live streaming this event. So that is something that uh, folks at home and in their offices can watch at any time, uh, obviously bringing a bigger crowd uh, as well. We also will be building a page off this event on our site, uh, which will have that live stream as well as a, um, any background on, on the panelists, and then, uh, our moderator will be writing a story on this event as well, so that, that will uh, be up there. So hopefully that conversation can continue past today. Um, the logistics of this um, is we're, we're going to be opening with a, a keynote speaker and then a panel. Uh, we have taken questions in the sign-up. Uh, you had an opportunity to ask questions and, and submit questions. Uh, our moderator will have those and, and hopefully can weave them into the conversation. Um, we will also, I ask you, there is uh, on, your, on your tables um, surveys, and we ask you very much, uh, very much appreciate you filling those out and giving us feedback on, on how uh, the event went and, and um, ways we can improve upon it. As I said, we've done a lot of these, but we can always improve, and so we really appreciate that. Um, What's an event without a hashtag, of course, uh, these days? It's uh, Affordable Housing NJ. Um, and then last, certainly but not least, I want to um, recognize our sponsor for this event, um, in this case, Community Investment Strategies. Uh, we can't do these events without sponsors, and, and we certainly can't offer them free. I know you all go to a lot of events, and, and there's ticket charges. We don't do that. I think it's important to open these to the public but we can't do so without the sponsorship support. Uh, and I am going to introduce Steve Shallot, our business director, strategy director, uh, to say a few words about our sponsor, and then we can get the program started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is an important topic. It's going to be a great discussion, and uh, your, your time and attention is greatly appreciated. And uh, um, as Don said, we expect this to be, uh, have a wonderful outcome. Uh, sponsorship, it does make it possible for us to do these events and uh, to make them free to the public. So um, we'd like to express our gratitude to Community Investment Strategies, Inc., uh, otherwise known as CIS, um, for sponsoring this event today. Um, CIS is the largest women-owned developer in New Jersey, specializing in affordable housing, construction, and management for the last 25 years. And CIS has a portfolio, a portfolio now of over 3,000 units in New Jersey. So Christiana Folio, who is the executive director, um, prior to forming CIS, um, as she has served as the executive director of NJ um, HMFA, uh, chair of COA, and is currently policy advisor to the legislature and administ the administration on housing related issues. So thank you again to CIS for supporting the event. And um, we'll uh, move on with the program now. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, so now that we uh, were a partly a media company with with television, you know, we have incorporated into our talks um, video segments that help frame the discussion a little bit. And I would like to open with that. Are we ready to to, ru to run that? Here we go. Is that up here? So this is a, a brief video um, segment. 
sort of helping us frame the discussion, and then we will get the live people up here. To understand New Jersey's affordable housing situation, you need to go back roughly 40 years when the sleepy Burlington County town of Mount Laurel became ground zero for the crisis. The township of Mount Laurel decided that um, they would um, create a zoning ordinance in which they um, prohibited the construction of, of multiple, multiple family dwelling units and apartments and also trailer parks, anything that was what we would call more affordable housing. And the Southern Burlington County NAACP sued the, the township and said, look, you're prohibiting people from living here by making it impossible for them to live here. And we are not only in the path of growth, but we are closer to where the jobs are. Out of it came the state Supreme Court's landmark Mount Laurel One decision. It declared New Jersey the first state in the nation barred from using land use zoning to exclude the poor. But here's the thing, like a lot of law by judicial ruling, there wasn't a clear path forward for municipalities to follow it. So many towns didn't. Then you have Mount Laurel II in 1983, and that's where that case was more about remedies. How do you do this? More specifically, how does a judge determine whether a town is meeting its fair share? To be clear, affordable housing is for residents with low to moderate income. In New Jersey, there's three categories. Very low for families making under 30 percent of the median income for the area, low 30 to 50 percent, and moderate between 50 and 80 percent of the median. New Jersey is one of the highest cost of living states in the nation. Housing advocate Arnold Cohen explains in 1985, the legislature enacted the Fair Housing Act, creating the agency tasked with overseeing it all, the Council on Affordable Housing. What happened was is that we had a succession of governors who did not want to see this progress, and consequently we had a law jam. The council, or COA, was dysfunctional, to say the least, unable to give towns a clear number for their housing obligation, and local government did little to fix the issue on their own, though it did work for a while in the 90s. But for 15 years, there was little to no movement on affordable housing development. Most of the council's time was spent entangled in court challenges. Local government pushed back. Some cited concerns about meeting needs for transportation by developing more or overflow in schools and a decrease to property values. Municipalities, they're in the business of providing services. They're in the business of competing with each other to be the best municipality to provide the best services. So they're also looking for development that brings in tax rateables. Affordable housing does not bring in tax rateables. This, in my mind, is a racial issue. It has been a racial issue from day one in Mount Laurel, including Mount Laurel Township. And without the Supreme Court's mandate to overcome that, or at least put it at bay, Mount Laurel housing would never happen. In 2015, the state Supreme Court stepped in yet again, taking control from COA and putting the decision-making back in the hands of trial judges. Municipal governments sued some 350 cases. In January of this year, the courts ruled that towns would also have to make up for that 15-year gap period, adding on to the number of units required from each municipality. That number should be probably in the neighborhood of a little over 200,000 units statewide. It probably comes as no surprise that number is being disputed. All right, that was Bri Brianna Venozzi out there, thank you, uh, with NJTV News. So I'd, with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, um, uh, a, a great thinker on this issue and, and has become a good friend as well, and, and um, I, I, I'm really thrilled that he's joining us today. Uh, Peter Reinhardt, um, many of you know, is, is now the director of the Kislak Center at Monmouth University. Um, has been there since 2011 and was adjunct professor uh, back into the 90s. Uh, before that, he was a um, senior vice president and general counsel of Havnanian Enterprises for 33 years served for 10 years on the Council of Affordable Housing. I don't know if it was during those dysfunctional years that Brianna talked about. 
course not. Um, uh, also past president of the New Jersey Builders Association of Keep Writing and now chairman of uh, New Jersey Future. Um, I might add, and this is where we've uh, become friends along the way and, and, and uh, I'm a great admirer, he also served on the founding board of NJ Spotlight. Um, and uh, we are forever thankful for that. So uh, as I said, with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce Peter Reinhardt. Thank you, John. Thank you, NJ Spotlight. Um, I told John uh, a couple months ago when we merged NJ Spotlight with NJ TV that of all the nonprofit good things I've done in my life, that's one I feel the, the best about because journalism was, was and still is at such risk and to be able to keep it alive, get it started, keep it going, and then merge it so that these two great mediums of media, mediums of uh, print journalism, sort of print, you know, online, and, um, and video is just uh, a really great step for the future of news in New Jersey, and the beats that they cover are very important. So if you don't already support, do so, um, because even though they're merged with a bigger company, they're both nonprofits. They still need financial help. So thank you, John, for the opportunity. Um, <laughs> I chuckled when I heard hashtag because in another year that might have a new meaning. Everybody get that joke? I'm a child of the 60s. Never mind. <laughs> no, it's a slow joke. I just thought of it. It's getting there. I like it. Good. So it's hard to believe that over 40 years have passed since the Mount Laurel Doctrine arrived in New Jersey. It just coincidentally, I graduated law school in 1975, so I've sort of grown up with the Mount Laurel Doctrine. And as I look around the room, I don't see too many people that I recognize from the early days of the affordable housing battle in, in New Jersey. So that's kind of a good thing that a newer generation is, is involved. So I thought I would take a little time giving some historical perspective and some context, and then I'd like to float uh, a few ideas and some challenges that continue today. So much of the history and debate over affordable housing revolves around the roles of the government and the private sector. Following the end of World War II, the nation adopted housing policy to promote home ownership in large part to help the hundreds of thousands of returning war veterans. And the VA, Veterans Administration, the Federal Housing Administration, FHA, were established to help with low interest mortgages Public sentiment strongly favored promoting home ownership. The American dream coin, the term was coined. <coughs> and the availability of ample supplies of land in the nearby suburbs made construction of homes relatively easy. NIMBY was not yet a word. And it also helped that the greatest generation was predominant and the much larger to be baby boomer demographic was literally in its infancy and not yet ready to transform and dominate the housing market. Regulations were limited, zoning was easy, and the ability of providers to respond quickly to demand was also easy. As the 1950s moved into the 1960s, the exodus from the urban centers to the suburbs accelerated. And the racial tensions and decline in the cities combined with the demographics of the baby boomers growing up, desiring larger homes and suburban backyards, further accelerated the flight to the suburbs. The development of the interstate highway system and the ability of workers to commute to the cities and just as importantly for stuff, namely agricultural produce, to get to the cities and those close-in suburbs made that possible. As the city's decline got worse, federal housing policy's answer was the large monolithic affordable housing projects. And while initially thought to be a good solution, they became symbols of segregation and poverty and most have ultimately been demolished. Back in New Jersey, organizations looked for ways to bring affordable housing and integration into the suburbs. New Jersey had become the classic example of the growing suburban markets created by the exodus from New York, Newark, and Philadelphia. The first litigation, as you saw from the video in the Mount Laurel saga, resulted in the Supreme Court's Mount Laurel, first Mount Laurel decision, known as Mount Laurel I, in 1975. It's interesting and I think important to note that the lawsuit was not brought by a builder, not brought by a not-for-profit builder, but by the NAACP as a means to integrate the suburbs. 
following the Mount Laurel II decision in 1983, creating the famous or infamous builder's remedy, there was a flurry of activity. Within the judicial branch, the three designated Mount Laurel judges set up in the Mount Laurel decision began to set up processes for determining how much, quote, need for affordable housing there was, and also a process for handling the expected increase in lawsuits. The courts appointed masters who developed methodology to determine how much affordable housing was needed, and the housing need determinations varied depending on the, the group formulating them, but they were around 200,000 statewide. As invited by the Supreme Court with the creation of the builder's remedy, builders stepped up their applications to municipalities for, quote, inclusionary developments that included a percentage of affordable housing. Builders had the upper hand with the town if it proposed affordable housing. The perception, and frankly, probably the reality, was that builders clearly had the upper hand in dealing with towns who had ignored the Mount Laurel One decision or done very little. Most towns who had dragged their feet following the Mount Laurel One decision uh, now sought help from the state legislature to protect them from the development applications for affordable housing, inclusionary developments, and try to get a better result than they thought they could get if it stayed in the courts. The result was the enactment of the Fair Housing Act of 1985, which was coupled with the State Planning Act. One often forgotten part of the second Mount Laurel decision was the Supreme Court's reliance on something called the State Development Guide Plan. That was a mainly neglected document sitting in the DEP, ostensibly used as a tool for determining where to put state development dollars. The State Planning Act, creating the State Planning Commission, was adopted to develop a better state development planning tool than that old state development guide plan. The Fair Housing Act created the Council on Affordable Housing, COA, to take over the obligation from the masters, from the courts, to determine how much and where the affordable housing was to be created. You know most of that, but let's pause for a moment to recall the historical backdrop of this time as COA began its work. Again, the 1960s experienced tremendous racial tension, segregation was dominant, urban parts of New Jersey were not doing well, they were doing poorly in many areas, higher crime, poor schools, slum housing, failing infrastructure, and in many cases, corrupt leaders. Throughout the time period of the 70s and 80s, when the Mount Laurel one and two decisions were adopted, the experience of segregated municipalities, failing urban areas, lack of supply of decent affordable housing in many areas, as well as the predominance of single family detached lower density zoning continued. COA adopted its first round rules with that as its backdrop in the second half of the 1980s. The term rules, we've heard about the rules, was actually part of the Fair Housing Act requiring COA to establish rules and then review them and readopt or modify them every six years. That six year period was later modified to 10 years. And at the same time, the chair of COA was changed from one of the public members. The first chair was a, was a uh, gentleman from Freehold named Art Kondrup, who was just a public member, had been a local public official and did a wonderful job in getting through the first round rules. Well, that public member was then changed to the commissioner of DCA, a change that would later have some significance. Continuing into the second round rules discussion in the early to mid 1990s, that same backdrop remained. Now I, I joined CO, I was appointed um, in 1993 to COA. Uh, the, the Fair Housing Act required that there be a representative of the for-profit building community, and that was me. I had succeeded, actually my boss, Ara Hovnanian, who was the first for-profit builder member. So we began our discussion right about when I joined it, and, um, and that same backdrop of predominant single-family zoning, declining cities was still pretty much the rule. Regional contribution agreements, RCAs, you'll remember that term, they were originally a part of the Fair Housing Act, and they were a tool used widely by many suburban municipalities to retain much of their same community character of historical interest is that the su primary supporter of the RCA's inclusion into the Fair Housing Act was the then mayor of New Brunswick, who was also an influential state senator who saw the RCA as an opportunity 
to get more money into the cities. The RCA enabled a town uh, to transfer up to 50% of its fair share obligation to another town for a fee. Urban areas, while perhaps philosophically uncertain about that, were happy to accept the suburban money. As COA began its third round rule deliberations in the early 2000s, the backdrop, as well as the politics, had begun to shift. The housing market was shifting so that attached housing at higher densities in the form of townhouses, condominiums, became more market desirable, along with the traditional single-family detached homes. But even there, the smaller lots um, were, were become more of desirable to the market. Now, having been a builder for a good part of my career, I can tell you builders do not create the market. They only serve it. And so some of this market shift was due to ever-rising home prices, as was the, the nature of the time, and some to changing demographics as well, as younger age groups became part of the home buying public again. The housing market was very, very strong in the first half of the 2000s, if you remember, as easy mortgage money combined with strong job growth, strong economic conditions led to entice many people to buy a home, not just to live in, but as an easy, quick, sure thing, no lose money investment. Remember the big short. How many have seen that movie? If you haven't, you gotta watch that. I, I read the book first. I'm a pretty smart guy. I said, how the heck, when I, they said they were gonna make a movie, how could you possibly take those complicated financial and the way they did it with the woman in the restaurant talking and the woman in the bed? I said, holy mackerel, this is sheer cinematic genius. But, um, and I actually, for those first couple of years, would make my students watch it just to teach them about, about that part of history. Well, at the same time, suburban towns in New Jersey were getting pushback from existing residents about higher density coming to their town with all those school children, all that traffic, and poor people coming into our homes. Well, on the political front, a new governor, Jim McGreevy, had won election in 2001. And this is where a confluence of things happened that I think really altered the, the path of affordable housing in New Jersey. COA, I was on COA then. We had not been able to do much in the way of third round rule drawing since we were awaiting new data from the 2000 census. We made a conscious decision. The six years would have taken us to the late 90s, right around 2000, and, and we were convinced that it would be kind of not smart. We needed new census data. So uh, we said, let's just wait for that to come out. Well, at the same time, we have a new governor. And remember that thing about the chair being a public member, now being a DCA commissioner? Well, that new chair of COA was the new DCA commissioner. And the new commissioner was the former mayor of Cherry Hill, who was hearing the concerns from municipalities with the stronger growth and higher density push of the builders. She proposed a new approach in the third round COA rules in the form of a concept called growth share. Now, growth share as a philosophical concept had been around for a while. It had been an important topic of discussion among the esoteric planners and lawyers um, and, uh, in the housing community. And their, their iteration of growth share was very simple, really simple. Every development had to have some percentage as affordable housing, period. That's the end of growth share as they saw it. Well, as growth share became a concept embraced by some municipal officials and the chair of COA, it was modified so that it would allow each town to decide first how much it wanted to grow and then allocate a portion of that to affordable housing. Well, that was in contrast to the methodology used in the first two COA rounds, which was a very complex formula, lots of data, uh, that ended up spitting out of a, we used to call it the black box, Dr. Bob Rochelle from Rutgers, and, and it's, there were probably eight people in New Jersey that totally understood it. Um, and it was very complicated. And that formula approach had been litigated both in the first round rules and the second rules and had been upheld by the courts. So the growth share was new. So this new growth share methodology finally adopted by COA in early 2004 after a series of contentious public hearings and a rare, and I say rare, non-unanimous vote by COA. I was one of those people that voted against it. 
along with two other people I was able to convince. And two weeks later, I was no longer a member of COA. True story. Well, that third round rules were immediately challenged by housing advocates, most notably the fair share housing organization. And while very little affordable housing was actually being built and not much more being approved because of this litigation stalemate, along with the serious decline in the housing market due to the Great Recession, the antagonism toward affordable housing grew. In a 2009 gubernatorial can campaign, candidate Chris Christie made his opposition to COA a major part of his platform in his campaign, and COA became another four-letter word. For over 10 years, from 2004, when the third round rules were adopted, to 2015, the approval of new affordable housing developments was slowed to a virtual halt, while the litigation battles and the uncertainty for towns and builders remained as to how much and where the housing would be built. But the need for affordable housing didn't stop. It continued to grow. After over a decade of litigation, and the video sort of says, the Supreme Court stepped in. Well, the Supreme Court has stepped in three different times. The, the cases went up and down, up and down the court system. And again, nobody was doing anything because you didn't know what to do. You weren't sure of the outcome. So after that decade of litigation and the inability of the members of COA to agree on a methodology that would comply with the Supreme Court's directive during those series of up and down court cases, by the way, it was a four to four vote COA, that final vote, which was, so depending on your point of view, but in my point of view, the four members of COA who voted, you know, not to adopt rules that would again violate the Supreme Court's um, directives were courageous, and some of them were municipal members, by the way. Uh, the New Jersey Supreme Court in 2015 essentially rendered COA moot and turned control of affordable housing back to the trial courts. And fair share housing was given a prominent role in all the pending and future municipal court cases. I must admit that following that 2015 decision, I had thought that there might have been a legislative push to take back the process from the courts, because that's what was done following the Mount Laurel II decision. But that didn't happen. And in my opinion, it is now far too late for that to happen would only further delay the creation of the much needed affordable housing, including those thousands of units that grew in that backlog from that 10 or 11 year period when, when there was a stalemate. Um, and so I just think it would be way too late. Since then, there have been many settlements with thousands of approved affordable housing units. And I'm sure when the panel gets up there, we'll, we'll get the, the current numbers. Well, during that same period, the market and economic conditions changed dramatically as those boom years of the early 2000s turned suddenly and drastically down during the so-called Great Recession years of 2008 to 2010. Very little housing of any kind, very little development of any kind, let alone affordable housing occurred. And as the economy finally began to grow again, the location of the demand also had shifted. Now the hot markets were in the urban areas and the towns with train stations and those formerly hot market desirable towns in the suburbs weren't so desirable anymore. The baby boomers, myself being one, and I see uh, a few others here, um, were now looking to move down in house size and away from the low density suburbs to more urban areas or frankly in many cases out of New Jersey altogether. The now dominant Gen X and millennials, Gen Y, whatever you want to call it, um, seem to have much less appetite for those big suburban single family homes in the remote suburbs that New Jersey was known for. The fastest growing municipalities became the cities. Jersey City, Hoboken, West New York were all gaining population after losing population only 20 or 30 years before. Adaptive reuse, I love that term, of office buildings, schools, shopping centers, happening now in these urban and close-in towns. And that new demand in the formerly poor urban areas has resulted in poorer residents being pushed out. This gentrification is creating a whole additional need for affordable housing in those cities that are experiencing rapid growth in housing prices. And the New York Times a week or two ago, maybe three weeks ago now, ran a very excellent long article on that very sub subject of the gentrification. 
So the very premise for the original Mount Laurel litigation and the doctrine to move poor people out of the poverty-stricken urban areas and into the more affluent suburbs has literally been turned upside down. But the zoning in those suburban towns still largely reflects the now outdated and less desirable single-family housing on large lots. Some of those towns are now the ones with challenges to remain desirable and relevant for the market and frankly are in danger of becoming the next poorer communities. Very recent study, like in the last few days, by Morgan Stanley on housing demographics states that the Gen X and Gen Y millennials will increase housing demand by over 77% in the next 20 years. But the baby boomer cohort, and this is a significant number, will increase the supply of homes on the market by 43% as they transition into the move down market. That study goes on to posit that the type of housing preferred by the younger buyers does not match with the older single family housing supply that will be hitting the market. And that's not good news. That's not good news for the baby boomers who have come to expect to sell their homes at higher prices than the market is frankly likely to produce. So that creates opportunities to convert some of this older single family housing into affordable multi-unit homes without any new construction. Now let's take a step to aside and look at what I call the institutional structure of the New Jersey approach to affordable housing. The entire Mount Laurel Doctrine is the embodiment of a hybrid approach where local government is required to provide the realistic opportunities for the creation of affordable housing that is then built by the private sector, not by the government. The resulting New Jersey Supreme Court decision that created the Mount Laurel Doctrine placed the burden on local government, the obligation, only to zone for the housing and the expectation that the building community would provide the actual housing. So if the building sector, for whatever reason, whether it's a macroeconomic condition, market conditions, who knows what, decides to build less affordable housing, there is really little the government can do to force the production of housing. That's what happened during the Great Recession from 2008 to 2011 or so, when there was a serious drop in overall housing production. New Jersey has a tough enough job in attracting new business due to the generally unfavorable reputation as a business-friendly state. So striking the right balance between creating new affordable housing without adding too much in additional costs is a tricky one. So let me finish by posing what I see are some of the current and future challenges and policy issues in New Jersey regarding affordable housing. First, is there a fundamental right to housing? We need to decide that as a state. Who decides whether the housing will be for sale or for rent? Who should determine what affordable housing should look like, including the exterior appearance, the density, the height, the unit size? Shouldn't the builders who have the best information available on the market and have their personal money at stake, shouldn't they m make that decision rather than some town planning board? Should there be deed restrictions on the price or rent of affordable units? If so, for how long? Should the buyer of an affordable unit get to keep the upside in value when the deed restriction expires? If not all of it, how much of it? If any, what should the roles of the public and private sectors be in financing the construction and the sale of affordable housing? Should government put money into it? Down payment assistance or below market interest rates can really help making housing more affordable. What is the benefit to the general public in having or not having affordable housing? If there is a general public benefit, shouldn't the taxpayers pay for some of it? Can the private sector be mandated to build some affordable housing as a condition to building market rate housing? Must there be some quid pro quo to the builder for providing this public benefit for affordable housing? Should the general business community be obligated to contribute money towards affordable housing programs if a benefit is having more potential workers? 
Would shifting the cost of public education away from local property taxes to a broader state level tax remove some of the resistance to higher density housing? What should be done about the newly gentrified urban residents and the replacement of that affordable housing that's now gone to higher cost housing? Should the municipal land use law be overhauled? Should there be more regional approaches to housing and land use? Has home rule become too much of an obstacle to the implementation of smarter policies and fiscally sensible changes? Should we consider the use of eminent domain to allow government to acquire suitable sites that can then be transferred to builders for affordable housing or even built by government? Land banking by municipalities. The cost of land is a huge part of the total cost of a home. Government, maybe the state through the HMFA or municipalities buying foreclosed, foreclo foreclosed homes and making them affordable. That's been bandied about for a while. Maybe allowing the delinquent owners to remain so that they're not forced out on the street. But when they leave, the home now becomes a deed restricted affordable home. Do we give general business a tax credit if they provide down payment grants or mortgages to its workers or even to others, who not their workers, for affordable housing? Should we make the interest payments to the company by those workers non-taxable income so that they can lower the rate? While new construction will still be a primary means of adding new affordable housing, there can be alternatives to new construction for affordable housing units. Already happening, adaptive reuse of older non-residential structures like office buildings, shopping centers, schools, hospitals. Monmouth Mall in my area, of, uh, new in Monmouth County is, is actively planning that. This one might be a little controversial. Allowing existing large single family homes to be broken up into smaller rental or condominium units. This might be an option to deal with the projected glut of older single family homes, that 43% increase in the supply. Accessory apartments or cottages on homes with larger lots. That's been talked about for decades. Seattle is actually doing that now. Change the zoning to allow multifamily housing in single family home zones on the same footprint as a single family home. Minneapolis is doing that. Change the zoning to allow micro units, 400 square feet or less. Tiny houses, we've heard that term, or maybe more mobile homes. Increase the density around transit stops to provide more housing units along with affordable components. Many towns are doing this, but more can be done. One concern I've had for many, many years, like 25 years, is that once a town has met its COA or court settled fair share number, the towns will have no further incentive to consider zoning changes to reflect the need for higher density and more housing choices for those people who make too much money for the, the Mount Laurel uh, numbers, but not enough for uh, the high cost state of New Jersey. Without new residents and without new homes, those uh, towns run serious risk of home values declining, putting even more fiscal pressure on the town and on property taxes for the existing residents. We need to really work to get younger people on town governing bodies and planning boards. My generation should not be making decisions for the younger people. We need to get them more engaged, and the system doesn't really reward that. It rewards party loyalty and those kind of things. So we need to get younger people in the decision-making process. Finally, there is a need for a state housing policy. We don't have one. Fair Housing Act, is that a state housing policy? One of the real downsides to home rule is the lack of coordination of land use policies. I think we need a task force composed of private sector, both for-profit and not-for-profit leaders, along with government, county, municipal, state officials. Get them in a room, not just for a few hours, but it's gonna take, take, take a while but to come up with a proposal for a state housing policy to be recommended to the, the governor and the legislature. The State Planning Commission, remember the State Planning Commission? It's been largely defunct since Superstorm Sandy. So this new state housing policy should be adopted alongside a newly revised state development plan. 
obviously there are many, many issues to be considered as we go down that road, but not to go down that road is a disservice to the current and future residents of the state. Obviously, the issue of affordable housing is not the only major issue facing New Jersey. We've got marijuana legislation. No. But uh, seriously, the reform of the state pension and health benefits is so badly needed to free up funds that can be used for social programs like affordable housing instead of sustaining unsustaining employee benefits. Imagine the possibilities if there were additional billions of dollars every year from savings in the pension and health benefits that could be used for social programs like affordable housing or property tax relief or so many other good programs. So thank you for the opportunity to, to be with you. It's a great topic and um, I look forward to hearing from this very distinguished panel. The panel, if you want to join us. You know who you are. You do know who you are. Uh, the moderator, uh, NJ Spotlight's very own Colleen O'Day. Um, Colleen and I have uh, toiled in the newspaper world for a long time, both uh, print refugees, we like to call ourselves. Um, and Colleen joined uh, NJ Spotlight in 2011. Uh, she's an editor at large, which is a fancy way of saying she covers a lot of issues for us, uh, housing among them, um, but also is our, our primary data reporter, as well as the one who builds our fancy data maps, which you may be familiar with, a, a big feature. Uh, before that, she was a longtime reporter uh, with the Daily Record um, and uh, has also worked as a freelancer for a number of um, newspapers and, and media outlets is, and won multiple awards and, and fellowships. Really uh, one of um, the real jewels of, of journalism in New Jersey and, and we're thrilled that she can join us. I also believe this is the first time she's moderating one of NJ Spotlights. So um, welcome. Once we get them into this uh, event business, they'll never leave. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, Colleen O'Day and our esteemed panel. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. Yes, I was saying be kind. It is my first time, so I may make mistakes, probably a lot. Um, so I'm so uh, pleased and honored to be able to sit with uh, our panel today. We have some really great um, speakers. Uh, we hopefully have some good questions for everybody. Um, uh, you guys submitted more than 40 questions, which, wow, uh, I'm glad everybody's so interested. I'm gonna try to get to as many of those, and I think we're gonna cover some of Peter's questions as well, um, but first we wanna introduce everyone and let them say a little bit about themselves and um, their interest in housing. Uh, so I'm gonna start with Kevin Walsh, who is, yes, and we're gonna um, share the mics. Um, I, I probably Kevin doesn't need an introduction if you're here, but we'll, we're gonna let him do it anyway. Thank you, Colleen, and thank you um, to New Jersey Spotlight uh, for inviting me to share some thoughts today on affordable housing and where we're at. Um, when I started doing this work, I didn't need reading glasses, and I, I'm still adjusting to like how to do this. Um, so uh, I've been working at Fair Share Housing Center since 2000, um, after finishing a clerkship with the New Jersey Supreme Court, and. Um, have experienced, um, you know, much of what uh, Peter Reinhardt so uh, eloquently discussed about the history of this, and, and have had the privilege of being involved um, for almost 20 years in in fighting for housing justice. Which um, at Fair Share Housing Center we really view that as fighting for racial justice. Um, the reason we do this work is because where one lives impacts almost everything. Um, it impacts a lot in life, and it's so much more than just about shelter. Um, housing is, is not about four walls and a roof. Um, when you really think about it, it's about what kind of education you can receive. It's about what kind of air you can breathe and what the asthma rates are in, are in your neighborhood. Uh, it's about what sort of job opportunities and social networks you tie into. Um, it's, uh, it's whether you can play outside in many ways. 
Um, and it's overall about an opportunity to thrive, and we're not. Um, and New Jersey, as, as Peter discussed, has a demonstrated, documented problem with exclusionary zoning. Uh, look, we know from experience that New Jersey municipalities um, don't do the following. You know, the, you, j just imagine this. Um, planning board ga gaveled into, into the, the uh, session and um, chairperson says, all right, we're, we're here tonight to voluntarily discuss our fair share of the region's need for affordable housing. Has anyone ever seen that? It, it doesn't happen very often. And the reason it doesn't happen is because there are powerful political and other forces that prevent it from happening. And the, the local self-interest of politicians rarely involves how can we an overwhelmingly white neighborhood near Newark, white municipality near Newark, provide opportunities for people who are living in entrenched conditions of racial and economic apartheid. Conversation doesn't voluntarily happen. And because of that, we've had to have laws that require municipalities to do that. In one of the most racially and economically segregated states in the country, if, we, if our laws don't require that to happen, it will not happen. And so uh, those laws, statutes, court decisions, regulations, um, worked fairly well from about 1985 to 1999, generated now what's probably over that time period, 70, 80, 90,000 affordable homes, rehabilitated more of them, and that's pretty good. It's still a, a fraction of what's needed, but it's better than what a lot of other states did with, with similar policies. But then we entered a period of complete failure of, of, of implementing a housing policy in the state. Uh, rents rose at two times, home sales, uh, home prices in a for sale context rose at three times the rate of incomes. And that has real impacts. Go check out the book Evicted. Read about, learn about, if you're on the fence on this issue, what housing instability does to families and how it harms people. And then think about what happens when you have a system that does not create the housing that is needed for, uh, for, for folks and families especially to experience housing stability. So after what at the time was about 16 years of failure, of an affordable housing policy that is required by our state constitution, that is required by a statute, the Fair Housing Act, we now have a system in which the municipalities can voluntarily choose to go to court. And that's a system, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss it in, in further depth, um, that in which judges are providing a forum for municipalities to prove how they comply with the state's pretty good housing laws. Half of the housing has to be for families. At least 25% of it has to be rentals. No more than 25% of it can be for seniors. Municipalities can give a residency preference, but it has to be for their present need. It can't be for the prospective regional need. These are the sorts of things that, that um, in the past made our housing policy pretty good. And uh, just for purposes of, of those who, who are experiencing this in local municipalities, we see this as doomsday, the sky is falling. If, if we're wildly successful in this, between now and, or 2015 and 2025, if we just knock the socks off of this and get, house, get the housing market working again, wisely use public subsidies, we're talking in the best day about a 1% about a or so increase in the state's housing supply. That's what we're freaking out about. It's absurd. You know, what we should be talking about is not what this court process, which is closing in on about 300 towns having settled, what we should not be talking about is whether that's a good thing because it is, it is wildly doing better than what has preceded it in the past 20 years. What we should be talking about is how do we build on that? How do we make sure that zoning that is being put in place is, is, is built? How do we go to build on something that will actually provide the public subsidies that are needed to get the housing built. That's where I think a really helpful collective conversation um, should go. And it's not to say, sh should this court process continue forever? 
Hopefully it doesn't. I, I need sleep. <laughs> but, a, a, as Peter Reinhardt said, to stop it now is to just, and not replace it with anything, which is what the proposals are, is a delay in a study. To do that would be immoral. We have something now that is working. Is it perfect? No. But it's much better than anything that has come in the past. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, and yeah, let's, I know it, giving Kevin a soapbox is probably never a good idea because <laughs> two minutes becomes Was like that 20 four minutes. minutes. I, I think it was a little more, but that's okay. I don't mind being <laughs> shut down. <laughs> um, so next up, so if we could keep it a little bit briefer, that'd be great so we can get to some questions. Um, so next we have Assemblywoman Holly Shapizzi. She's from uh, Bergen County and she's quite interested in housing as well. Uh, Assemblywoman. Good morning, everybody. And uh, for those of you in the room who do know me, who do know Kevin, I assure you that the apocalypse is not coming, that we're sitting on the same stage. But <laughs> we, um, this is an incredibly complicated issue. And it's something that I got involved with uh, Actually, back in approximately 2005, um, I became a new borough attorney. I had been working in the city for years as a lawyer, had handled multi-billion dollar transactions around the world, and had never worked on something as confusing and convoluted as tr attempting to get our housing plan for where I live through COA. And I had a mayor who believed it was a moral obligation to, you know, in a town that had not been compliant, to do what we needed to do and tasked me to go out and figure out a way to make us one of the communities that proactively provided affordable housing. I became an expert in a topic that I candidly knew nothing about at that time and realized how, as designed, it was designed to fail. And as designed, it's something that was so unnecessarily complicated and just so difficult to comply with that it was disincentivizing people to actually do anything. And it's really surreal for me to be sitting here now saying this after you know seeing firsthand how COA was so dysfunctional and yet I'm one of the people advocating that we actually put COA back in place because that was better than what we're doing now. And as a member of the legislature, I respectfully disagree with uh, Kevin saying that, you know, this is something that we should have the courts continue to be doing. I'm a legislator. We are here to make the laws for the state of New Jersey. We have abdicated our responsibility and our jobs as elected officials by having this be determined through the courts. And we can agree to disagree on how we get there or what potentially the best means of getting there is, but policy that got set based upon you know, court decisions that took place when I was three years of age no longer necessarily hold true for best models in New Jersey moving forward. By doing it through the courts, what we've done is in a state that's known for corruption, in a state that's known for you know, not necessarily being good government, we have pushed everything into closed door discussions where members of the public are not being shared information by municipalities there is absolutely nothing that is voluntary about municipalities going to court for these settlements. Settlement discussions are taking place in literally the dark of night. Borough attorneys are telling their mayors and council not to share with the members of the public what is taking place. And you know, Kevin just said it's a 1% increase in you know, overall numbers. Well, nobody knows because nobody's been keeping track of what those overall numbers are. We do not know as we sit here today how many rental units versus how many for sale units. We don't know how many units are going into urban areas where the gentrification and the spread of people between 
you know, the wealthiest and the poorest is actually becoming worse rather than better. In areas that millennials and other people would want to move into, that have vibrant, robust jobs, transportation, nightlife, they're being priced out of it because there were no affordable housing obligations whatsoever in those communities. And members of those communities are now revolting, saying, we need this. We want this. Why are you putting this stuff out in Park Ridge, New Jersey, where New Jersey Transit is so overwhelmed that the current population can't get on a bus or a train? And so these are the real life considerations that we're trying to have you know, adult discussions about. And it's, it's like touching the third rail. It's very easy to say anybody who wants to change how we've been doing this you know, is trying to protect a white neighborhood or something like that. I went through the towns that I represent because I was curious as to what our racial demographics are right now. Things have changed. I have a 15-year-old daughter. I have a 7-year-old son. My 7-year-old son's class is exceptionally diverse. So I started looking at data that we accumulate for our schools. There are communities that I represent that maybe 30 years ago were 99% white, but are now 50% Caucasian. And we have to have honest discussions about what we're attempting to do and why, because the current system is actually failing all of the people who need affordable housing. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and next is John Restrepo. He's the chairman of the board of the Housing and Community Development Network of New Jersey. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, again, I'm John Restrepo. I'm also the director of housing for uh, Garden State Episcopal CDC. We're a nonprofit uh, based in Jersey City. I'm the director of housing and community development. Uh, in my mind, I think this conversation about where affordable housing is in New Jersey and where it's going forward is, is really in two buckets. Uh, and some of those buckets are actually overlapping in some areas like Hudson County, which is our, uh, our primary our target area. And that's the bucket of, of the COA conversation, but the continual bucket of trying to revitalize urban areas uh, that have been historically uh, disinvested and, uh, and where there's a large concentration of poverty. Just as, uh, as far as background, and uh, the organization has built around 300 units over 100 sites. If you do the quick math, you see that most of the housing that we do is uh, low density and is really filling the missing teeth in the urban centers. Uh, uh, we started in Jersey City, but now we have expanded into six other municipalities in Hudson County. And we actually just completed a COA project in uh, the city of Bayonne. Most of our work in Jersey City for the organization over the past 30 years has been the traditional uh, trying to use affordable housing as a mechanism to revitalize the urban centers, and really it's a program uh, to try to serve the needs of the people that live there. Uh, today, as Peter and, and, and Kevin and everyone else, uh, we all know that there's now this uh, system of uh, displacement happening uh, as a result of a gentrification where now a place in Jersey City like Greenville where the rent was $700 a month, uh, 10 years ago the rent is now $2,000 a month for a two-bedroom apartment and the dynamics as far as income have not changed much. So our role as a CDC sector is really to uh, fill in the gaps that either the marketplace doesn't take care of or government doesn't have the capacity uh, to, to initiate. Uh, just to put it in perspective, and this is statewide, and the Eagle Tim Institute did a poll where nine out of 10 New Jerseyans, regardless of where they live, are concerned about paying their mortgage or paying their rent. Uh, in some neighborhoods, like Greenville that I described, uh, the cost burden is about 90% of the population is cost burden, and obviously that creates other social issues. So I think uh, my uh, what I'm bringing to the table, and Kevin is obviously the expert in COA, is uh, what what you know what this whole discussion and how it impacts the urban centers and the CDC sector and the importance of our, our role in the urban centers to make sure that they uh, remain good places to live. Uh, but also affordable to folks that have been there for decades that are now being pushed out into other areas, and, and, and that's the, the, the issue that we're dealing with today. The bottom line is this. I think our for affordable housing needs to take place in both places. We cannot uh, move all poverty-stricken people, lower income from the urban centers into the suburban centers, uh, but I also believe uh, that the, the COA philosophy is a good idea 
uh, to give opportunity to lower working class people to move into more affluent communities that also have uh, better educational systems uh, while we urban centers work together. Bottom line is, you know, uh, but, um, as uh, Colleen mentioned, I'm also uh, the chairman of the board for the Housing and Community Development Network. And the role of that organization is to assist nonprofits like Garden State Episcopal in advocacy at the local, state, and federal level, uh, making partnerships with the private sector, uh, but also providing uh, technical assistance. And it's with the end goal of really uh, having people, families, and communities reach their potential, addressing their challenges, because we wholeheartedly believe that given the opportunity, most people will respond uh, appropriately, and we will all, as a society, benefit from, benefit from it. Uh, Peter asked a tough question of, uh, you know, that it starts with uh, what our philosophy and belief is if we believe that housing is a right that everyone in America should have quality housing, regardless of your income or background. We wholeheartedly believe in that. We also believe that other um, realms like education and health are associated uh, at the same level and it's everyone's right to have access uh, to those things um, so that we can all move forward and reach our potential. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Uh, next is Christiana Folio, and she is the uh, founder and CEO of Community Investment Strategies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are an affordable housing developer, um, but I think you heard in the opening remarks about 50% of my professional life was actually spent on the public sector side, um, usually in groups that are not uh, this one. I usually say, yes, I was the chairperson of COA, please don't throw anything at me. Um, <coughs> however, um, I did leave because I, I hope that today I add um, a little bit of maybe the deep dive into some of this. Um, I left examples so that we can have in our mind, what are we building? Um, what, what does it look like? What are the options that municipalities have? So on the table, there's a couple examples of, of projects because um, in these settlements, there's a variety of ways that municipalities are working um, to meet their uh, obligations. Um, but I didn't know what Peter was gonna talk about this morning. I'm so happy to share today with him again. Um, <coughs> but I, my, my bottom line was housing policy. And actually during um, Governor Corzine's uh, tenure, there was a housing commission that was formed. Um, it's still on the books, but um, when uh, Governor Christie came in, you know, was not really very interested in pursuing that. Um, so I think there are some mechanisms already in existence that could help us move a little bit further down the road. But I, I just wanted to share why I think we need a housing policy. And this week in particular, I think, would draw um, a lot of attention. And I'm, I'm so glad that the Assemblywoman's here. So um, I was invited to a round table at DCA to talk about the priorities for the balanced housing fund. And I know that we're all very happy that the budget that has been submitted to the legislature is not taking $60 million from balanced housing. But I think it has to be underscored that that's not a give. The 60 million is not a give. It's a promise not to take. The balanced housing fund, and Peter remembers, when the Fair Housing Act was created, the idea was that affordable housing in New Jersey should not be dependent on a, an appropriation by the legislature because it would make it too political. And so the balanced housing is a percentage of the real estate transfer tax actually tied to the growth of housing and transfer of real estate that should fund our obligations. And to underscore what Peter said, it was not to be a f fiscal burden to build upon a municipality. Over the years, um, balanced housing, I think, did a really good job. But then when the market crashed, there was no money for balanced housing. And then when we started to see money flow back into balanced housing, um, and uh, the governor, uh, Governor Christie was the first governor to do this, looked to shift the burden of related housing costs that were funded by the uh, state budget and started to use balanced housing funds for that. So for about 10 years, maybe 12 years, there was really no production money available. <coughs> so now our governor decides, and uh, kudos to him, that they're not gonna raid. Last year they did. They raided $60 million out of balanced housing, so again, there was no production subsidy. So they're not going, uh, well, we hope, once the budget is approved, which is not approved, 
that there won't be another raid of $60 million. That's great. But the commissioner is now having roundtables with a variety of people, some of which are in the room, to decide how should that be prioritized. That's great. That's one leg of the stool. At the same time, the HMFA is now coming up with new policies which says that inclusionary development is not going to be subsidized. Now, we had all known and working in the field, and some of this may be a little bit too deep of a dive, but I think it's important, that 9% um, credits fund a lot of uh, affordable housing in the state, but inclusionary development um, was not eligible for that funding. I think there are two things with inclusionary development that maybe we should talk about today. One is that in most states, and if you look even in New York City, inclusionary developments are incentivized. And, and even if you said um, in your zoning ordinance, maybe 10% uh, uh, has to be provided by the developer, but if you go to 20%, you can get some subsidy for that additional 10%. That's the way it usually works. There's an incentive somehow, not just in density, but actually in cash. And the reason I think New Jersey has to focus on the cash and not the density is because there is a fallacy in the basis that the developer pays for the affordable housing. The developer does not pay for the affordable housing. The market rate buyer pays for the <laughs> affordable housing. And so we've made the, the on both end of ends of the scale, a market rate housing too expensive because we are adding the cost and the cost burden of providing the affordables and inclusionary. And I think inclusionary is critical. I think it creates mixed income, it balances out, it creates better communities. It's something we should support. Um, so those were, I, I think, the That's topics great. for today. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and last but not least is uh, Deanna Minus Vincent, and she is an assistant vice uh, president with RWJ Barnabas Health. Good morning. I think my experience uh, is quite different than my fellow panelists, both my experience and my current position. So I am not a health care uh, housing expert, although I did spend some time at the Department of Community Affairs probably when Peter uh, left COA. I oversaw the what I consider the softer side of housing, uh, weatherization, community services block grant, um, neighborhood preservation, playgrounds. But the bulk of my career was spent in really thinking about the services and supports that help people out of poverty. And my current role at RWJ Barnabas is really thinking about how we can help people along their pathway out of poverty. RWJ Barnabas, two years ago, really changed its mission to not think about just health care, but health. And while that seems like a really small change, and it is a really small word change, it is a seismic change when we think about the overarching effect. Because what we said is that we're not just thinking about clinical care, but we're thinking about a person's overall health. So the things that affect them socially. So what we know is that where people live and where they play really affect, affects their health outcomes. So we know that if someone continues to come to the emergency room because they have a cough or they have asthma and they go home to a house that's unsafe, it has mold and it has um, rodent hair and it has holes in the wall and it's overcrowded and they keep coming back and coming back and they go back to an unsafe house, that they're going to continue to be sick. We have to fix the housing. So I really challenge us not to just think about affordable housing, but it has to be safe, it has to be healthy, and it has to um, support their health. So what we've begun to do in all of our anchor institutions, we have 11 hospitals throughout New Jersey, and we serve 5 million of the state's 9 million residents. We've thought about housing efforts, and they, they differ depending on our communities. We've provided rental ho housing vouchers to some people. We've also provided transitional housing for people who are chronically ill. We are also building affordable housing for some because we know that's a critical component, but we know it's just one component. We have to think about food security. 
you also have to think about how people um, get educated about their own health. It's all a piece of the puzzle. So I think that's the piece that we bring to the table, and we have to think about how it all interweaves. Thanks very much. Okay, let's get started. Um, Kevin, I want to ask you the first question, which is kind of to bring us up to date uh, on the court process. How many settlements do you have? Uh, how many do you have left to go? Um, do you have any idea how many units are authorized at this point? Uh, where is construction underway? And ultimately, how many units do you think will be built as a result of this process? Um, so there are about 340, 350 municipalities in the court process. They, there are 283 inked settlements, um, and there are a couple of towns that have indicated they're not likely to settle and are electing, as is their right, to litigate their obligation or to litigate their compliance with their obligation. Um, and there are um, the issue of numbers of units that uh, are needed is something that Judge Jacobson set at statewide in the Mercer County, Princeton, West Windsor litigation at about 155,000 being the need. Um, you know, and that's the point in this where like people are supposed to run out of the room screaming because that's like the big number that scares people. Um, but the reality is that the system has been set up to, to, to very substantially reduce that number. You can get one family unit or one supportive housing bedroom can count as two units, and and so there's um, the 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 number of of homes actually produced. Uh, and again, this was the subject of testimony at trial, including from the League of Municipalities, um, was is likely to be very substantially lower than 155,000. Uh, many of the homes have already been built from 2015 to now, but the numbers suggested that the total number of affordable homes built from 2015 to 2025 using all of the different numbers could be around 50,000. Um, and so it is, um, a lot of that will depend on the market. A lot of that will depend on the availability of public subsidies. Um, and, you know, let me just point, point out that there's no one that is saying how many single family homes have we zoned for that are 3,400 square feet. I mean, that's also a good question if you're looking at fair housing because the reality is that New Jersey municipalities are inclined to approve large lot homes. Um, they're inclined to approve overwhelmingly the um, uh, offices and you know, shopping locations, that which are, are, are somehow viewed as better. And so in order to really understand land use in New Jersey, you have to look at all the different kinds of housing that is permitted. And there are many places where zoning has been in place for decades. That, um, are, that are single family housing. When the market in those areas just doesn't demand it. When the workers need housing that is denser because the land costs are lower. Um, because the market is very different. And so the, you know, the folk, it's a fair question, Colleen, I think how many homes are expected, but to focus on it without focusing on all of these other things, I think, is to put some undue attention on, you know, there are no legislators going around saying, um, there's a lot of warehouses being, be, being built and it's leading to overdevelopment and we really have to, what we need to do is put a moratorium on warehouse development because, boy, that's really, if we build too many warehouses, that's really gonna harm our environment. No, they're not doing that. And the reason they're not doing that is because it doesn't get them votes. But what, what gets votes is, is, is creating pandemonium. It's coming in and saying, 
as some of the statements have been, you're going to have to build 70-story buildings in your town in order to meet your obligations. I can show you the YouTube videos. That's what gets votes. That's what scares people. And, and it's happening all over the state. Wildly unsuccessful thus far because the need is for housing is so great. Um, so, Thank you. Um, Assemblywoman Chapizzi, I think uh, Peter asked the question, and it was one of the questions I was going to ask. Um, is there a right to housing? Do you think that that is a, something that is a right, uh, or should it be a right? And if so, what is New Jersey's role, the state's role in that? I, I think we all agree that we need to work together to ensure that nobody is homeless, that people have safe housing within the state. Where most people take issue, and you know, just using Kevin's numbers, if there are 50,000 affordable homes being built between 2015 and 2025, it doesn't take into account the density bonuses that the builders are getting in order to build those 50,000 affordable units. So you're now at 250 or 300,000 units of housing being simultaneously built. We are already the most dense state in the entire nation. We have the largest out-migration right now out of pretty much any state. We have the highest taxes. We have a 0.3% population growth. And we lead the nation in the number of foreclosures. Our current policy of now on every last available inch of open space to build high density housing makes absolutely no sense when you look at the collective you know, picture of New Jersey. You know, nobody's saying that we should not work together to find affordability, but we're creating policy that is actually creating unaffordability. I'll give you an example. I represent a town called Dumont, New Jersey. Dumont, by any stretch of the imagination, should be a town that is viewed as affordable. People live on 50 by 75 foot lots, 11, 1200 square foot homes, but because of failed policy in the state, their property taxes for that home are almost $13,000 a year right now. And that's insane. So what are we doing? Fair share goes into Dumont, forces a settlement, the last remaining farm in the town is now high-density luxury housing with a pilot agreement, payment in lieu of taxes, where the people who are going to be living in the luxury build are going to be paying maybe the equivalent of $2,000 a year for the next 20, 30 years to live in that community, while the people who are already struggling, who are already blue-collar, who are already trying to maintain their homes are going to see their property taxes disproportionately increase over the next 20 years, causing them to not be able to afford or keep their homes. So you know, it's something whereby, let's look at the 70,000 foreclosed properties from 2017. Let's look at building ways for home ownership for people. Not everybody wants a rental. Not everybody wants to leave their community. People want options within their communities to rise up and go from a rental to maybe something that they own. And you know, I just think that we're operating in kind of this bubble where we're not, we're not having the smart conversations of how to do it better. Okay, hey, John, yeah, I wanted to ask you is don't towns have some right to self-determination in this process in terms of they can choose to try to have a nonprofit um, builder build a, a fully affordable uh, development ha uh, apartment, whatever it is, and then not have that builder's remedy kick in, not have uh, greater density? Does that work? Yeah, um, I can actually speak about that in the context of Jury City, which has a lot of similarities to the discussion uh, about COA and uh, more suburban towns. It's, it's something that's uh, really uh, happening lo locally. But before I answer the question, the bottom line is that we're, while we're here debating these issues, the, the need continues to increase because the market force, as I see it, is, is really coming from the uh, up north where I'm at, it's coming from the New York City market. If you put a, a pin on New York City and draw a 45 mile radius, it's pushing all the way there because the need for land. And so in places like Jersey City, we're actually doing both. Uh, right now, the, what's being debated 
is an inclusionary zoning ordinance that actually housing professionals, some of you who are sitting here, have been advocating for in Jersey City for the past 10, 15 years because we saw this wave of development coming and what it was going to do to the regular working class people because the market was set by a small segment of, of, of the total market. The median income in Jersey City is 66000 60, or something like that. The fair market rent for a three-bedroom apartment is over $2,000, and in downtown is $5,000. Those are Central Park West rents, okay? So uh, in, in the meanwhile, the majority of the population, 50% is cost burden, paying more than 30% of their income, meaning they've got to take money out of their pocket uh, to pay for housing. Now they have, may have to sacrifice quality food, health care outcomes. Uh, education and so forth. So we're actually doing, uh, uh, the city's trying to deal with both, uh, but we feel that that inclusionary zoning ordinance should have passed a long time ago uh, because there are many um, uh, lost opportunities in not being able to create 80-20 deals like you see often happen in, in New York City, which is normal over there and it works. If you tell me that you have a market that the, where the rents is $5,000, there's a good opportunity for cross subsidization and I don't see the nothing uh, particularly wrong with a developer doing that because even though, yes, uh, that's what the market is willing to pay, I think at the end of the day when you look at these budgets, it's really a question of profit margin. What's an acceptable profit margin? 10%, 12%, 20%. What is that number? That's the constant number when we need to have those discussions. Once you set that, then you can run a budget to figure out how those rents can help you support a lower income population. So the city of Jersey City has been doing this on a case by case, project by uh, project basis, but it's undeniable that today with this kind of market force downtown, uh, it, it can work very well throughout the city, uh, but particularly uh, downtown. By the way, downtown Jersey City 30 years ago was uh, a low income sector and most of the people are being displaced and pushed out into other parts of the city. Now the whole city and uh, most of the low-income uh, population is being pushed out of the city altogether because the market force is so great and there's such opportunity to develop in Jersey City with, with still land available in close proximity to mass transportation and really, you know, a quick jump in, into the Hudson River, uh, I mean, over the Hudson River gets you into New York City. So those are the dynamics. We, the CDC, uh, have been working in the urban neighborhoods that were really abandoned by the marketplace where the numbers didn't work, where the median income didn't support not even the construction of a single family house. Uh, and, so, and so those were the dynamics that we were uh, uh, dealt with. Also public policy could have been better uh, to deal with those situations. So the CDC sector came in, for example, and what we did is we created a market from existing renters to become homeowners and sold about 100 homes. And that is the way that we're creating wealth so that uh, people who are stuck in poverty can create some generational change and hopefully the older uh, folks uh, that, that were low income can see their kids and make that change in one generation. Things that may take two or three generations are happening through home ownership. A family making 40 to 60 grand can never believe that they can buy. A uh, hundred of our buyers have not been working with a broker on MLS. Uh, and so those are the things that are happening in Jersey City, which I think uh, we b always do better, but it's also a model for what can happen throughout the state. We need to do both. Thank you. Uh, Christiana, I wanted to ask you, you, you mentioned um, the State Balanced Housing Fund, um, and we, we're talking about the cost of this. How, how do we pay for this? Um, what is the state's obligation? Um, you know, what, how much should taxpayers uh, put up? And, and what kind of a profit should builders be able to expect? I'm never going to answer that last question. Uh, <coughs> but... Um, I'll dance around that one. Um, <coughs> I, I really do believe that um, the state has not um, really stepped up to the plate in the way that the original um, drafters of the Fair Housing Act thought that the state would be a player. Um, I think um, that, you know, as I was explaining, um, I think this state housing policy really has to be focused on where's the money. Um, <coughs> and, um, you know, trying to prioritize and answer some of the questions that Peter talked about this morning um, would really give us those priorities in terms of how to spend the dollars. What I see happening is things are just getting splintered off and priorities are being created by the different state agencies in terms of 
what that group thinks is the priority and where they should put their funding. And it's very siloed at this point. So I do believe that there's a role, um, whether it's talking about the COA or talking about a state housing policy, there needs to be some state direction. And then we can look at leveraging the dollars. Obviously, there's a, a cost share um, formula that hopefully we could um, come to agreement, and it's on all sectors. It's, it's, it is reasonable profits for developers. It is a substantial incentive or uh, use of our balanced housing dollars and making sure that it is preserved for the reasons that it was created. And it's using those tax credits in a much more aggressive way, in my opinion. Um, so I, I believe that we could get there. Um, I do believe, though, to um, pick up on Holly's point, that if the state took a more aggressive role in funding the inclusionary developments, there could be s less pressure on how much density the host community would have to have because they would not have to internally subsidize that amount of affordable housing. So I really do, and maybe it's because um, my background is economics first and planning second, that I start with how do you make this financially viable and then back into what's the physical plan. And I think for a long time, we've been starting with what's the physical plan and then kind of chasing our tail in terms of how to fund it. Thank you. Um, Deanne, I wanted to ask you, I think you touched on some of this and it's probably something we should have maybe talked about from the beginning, but what is the problem? I mean, how, how many people need housing? How, how critical is this issue? And I think you touched on some of the implications for, for folks who are not living in, um, in units that are either uh, up, you know, up to code or you know, really decent housing. So I think in New Jersey, there are 43, excuse me, 40% 40 of New Jersey cannot meet their basic needs. So that means they can't afford food, they can't afford heat, they can't afford prescriptions, they can't afford what they need to survive. And that's a lot. I mean, the face of poverty in New Jersey is changing. And when you look at true homelessness, um, there's over 8,000 people who are homeless. And some live on the street. Some are um, couch surfing. And this is a huge problem. Um, I think we, even people who have worked in this field for a long time, it's still kind of gut-wrenching when you think about um, how much people make, when you think about our seniors, when you think about people who are dual eligible, meaning that they are eligible for both Medicaid and Medicare, we're living on less than $10,000 a year in this country. I mean, that's, that's pretty sad. So affordable housing needs to be truly affordable. If you think about 1.9 million New Jerseyans are living in overcrowded housing, housing that doesn't have sufficient plumbing and heating, um, I think that matters. So for instance, I was just speaking with one of our social impact and community investment leads in New Brunswick. And in New Brunswick, we have a program that we have community outreach workers who go into the houses and assess the houses and make sure that they are safe and teach the um, homeowner or, or the renters to um, clean appropriately. They assess it to make sure it doesn't have mold or um, lead and they refer them to the appropriate sources. And sometimes the individuals are undocumented and they don't want to, um, they don't want to let anyone in. They don't want to alert the landlords. And this becomes a huge problem and a huge tenant landlord issue for them. So it, so how we not only, um, as I said earlier, make it affordable, but make sure that we create policies so that once that, that apartment goes back on the market, it's being um, assessed that it's up to code, which isn't currently the case because when they went into that unit, it, already ha it was already dilapidated and people are, are renting it because it's the only thing they can afford but it doesn't have running plumbing. It doesn't, it's, it's, mold, it's moldy. And then their kids are just ending up in the emergency room. So that's the need that we're seeing in New Jersey. We're seeing that people can't afford it, that they don't have the resources, that they're spending 50, 60, 70% of their income on rent. 
and that's not just people who we are cons or are undocumented are people who are sponging off the um, welfare system. I think it's 49% of all renters in New Jersey are rent burdened. That means that they're spending more than 30% of their income on rent. So, I mean, I think that's a huge percentage. So, I mean. Well, this is, I'm gonna open up to anyone, uh, raise your hand if you're interested in answering. Um, there are there are several different kinds of needs we've talked about, and I'm wondering if if we're filling or how we're filling the need for seniors, uh, the very low income, uh, the disabled, the homeless, veterans. Are we are we doing a good job with that, um, Assemblywoman? And I'm sure we'll have different views on this. Um, I actually was outside counsel for the Bergen County Housing Authority, helping build their 100% um, projects for some of these specialty populations, seniors, veteran, disabled. And one of the issues and big hiccups with our current policy is that we have these artificial limitations. So while our seniors are really struggling to stay in homes, even those that have mortgages paid off, but their property taxes and the cost of living is so high that they can't make it on their social security payments, but want to remain in their communities that they've lived in, that their friends, their families, everybody are there, but yet we have these 25% caps that disincentivize communities from providing that sort of housing because it no longer counts towards their obligation. In addition to that, preference, at least in the suburban communities, cannot be given to the seniors within those communities or that housing no longer counts towards the overall numbers as well. Likewise, we have the largest special needs population. We have the highest rate of autism in the entire country. One of the most shocking things for me was going out and delivering Meals on Wheels, going into households in my community that are supposed to be a wealthier community, finding 80-year-old, 85-year-old parents who are getting Meals on Wheels delivered while taking care of a 60-year-old um, specially abled son and having no idea where their child is going to go or what's going to happen to them and not really having appropriate resources for that sort of housing. And so I think that you know, in our overall discussion of this, people who are struggling with generational poverty have a far different housing need than a senior who's been in a community for 50 years or a single mother who recently went through a divorce who wants her kids to stay in a school system and not you know, further create trauma in the family, or somebody who needs transitional help because of a health issue or loss of job, and uh, as well as a millennial. So here we are kind of uh, you know, putting everybody into the same bucket, creating this one type of housing for all in a policy that really is not helping. You know, talking about Jersey City, talking about housing where, you know, people have holes in the walls and mold. We need to provide resources to rehabilitate those sort of uh, properties in conjunction with just building new all over the state for, you know, developers to be able to rent stuff out at $5,000 a month. So I think we really need to work on better policy for each of those populations. So with all due respect, the assemblywoman just articulated a policy that, exclu that, that permits the wide exclusion of families from, that are lower income from suburbia. And it's not to say that housing for people with um, disabilities isn't important. And the Mount Laurel process is providing more than has ever been done in the past. And you can ask people who build that housing for people with disabilities, some of whom are here, what has gotten more to happen? The court process that is requiring towns to do something or an endless period of examination? You can ask them afterwards. As for seniors, yes, seniors that are lower income need affordable housing, but they need it at far lower rates than families, and the data shows that. And so it's easy to say, Seniors need housing and there are holes in the wall in Jersey City. Of course we should fix the holes in the wall in Jersey City, but let's look at relative need. And the need in New Jersey for affordable housing is overwhelmingly lower income families. 
And our social policy has, has overwhelmingly perpetuated the racial and economic segregation of our state. For generations, it was the law that permitted it. And formal and informal policies continue it today. And given that, we just have to ask ourselves, uh, are we a state that believes in segregation? And what comes with it? And are we willing to, to, per, to perpetuate the extremely high rates of racial and economic segregation in our cities? And if we are, then yeah, go ahead and meet the needs of everyone else and exclude lower income families from suburbia. And we'll con continue with generational cycles of poverty for decades and decades to come. What's happening now is something that can actually break generational cycles of poverty for families. It can link lower income families of color to opportunities that they have been denied by government policy. And that's what we have to do. You know, the, the, the whole idea of, of veterans housing, we could do it next year. We could end veterans homelessness next year. You know what you'd need to do? The state would need to step in and make sure that municipalities either willingly use their land or take, them, take the land and make them do it. But I'm really tired of people bemoaning the need for veterans housing when the resources are available to do it. We just need the political will. And it's outrageous how easy it is to talk about uh, veterans housing. And it's really easy to do it. It's harder to build it because Munici municipalities every day of the week could get COA credit, could get Mount Laurel credit for the veterans housing they build. But the, and under existing law, they could provide a preference 50% for veterans. Every day of the week in every single affordable home. You know how many are doing it? I could count it on one hand, the number I'm, I'm aware of that are using that preference. Why? Well, for many of them, they want to talk about how important it is to help veterans. But at the end of the day, vet, lower income veterans are overwhelmingly veterans of color. And somehow they lose the political will be between Memorial Day and the time to prepare their fair share plan. I don't know why that is. Every single conversation I have with, with municipalities, I say, it'd be great, let's do this for veterans. And let's do it for veterans' families too because they're, they're so there's a disconnect here between what we're saying our values are and how we're implementing those policies in ways that meet the needs of veterans, that meet the needs of lower income families in ways that, that, that promote racial and economic integration. And that's a reality. I think John wanted to say something. Yeah, I think the, the question was, are we doing a good job, right? And uh, I think the answer is obviously no. Uh, while we're at the stalemate with COA, I don't know how many years, it's almost a decade now. Uh, lots of units have not been built. So we got to figure this out and figure it out fast because the need is increasing. I want to keep highlighting that. The other thing that I want to make sure it does is not lost in context of this conversation, because most of the focus is on COA, is that also for a total of eight years, which is a long period of time, uh, the governor was diverting balanced housing funds to other programs. The net effect of that is, uh, I think the, the, the upcoming uh, funding level is $60 million is what I'm hearing. I don't know what it would have been in those eight years, uh, but it's definitely more than zero. And those are dollars that could have been utilized to continue to tackle the foreclosure crisis in the, un in, in the inner city uh, and create affordable housing in the inner city. So uh, effectively what it has, that has done is it put a lot of community development organization like Garden State Episcopal out of business. I am sitting here speaking to you because Jersey City had an individual trust fund that comes out of the a tax abatement. Uh, we could have a debate about whether that uh, the unit payout was appropriate or not. I say no, uh, but still it generated a good over $50 million to produce. But it, that's the only reason we were able to continue to uh, do that work. So I'm glad that balanced housing is back, but like Chris said, it's important to make sure that the money is going to the right places. I do agree with the state that in some cases uh, we should not be subsidizing towns who knew they were responsible for creating X units and we're putting off that responsibility and there has to be some accountability there and they should have to put some money in the deal. An example of that, and I'm not saying Bayonne was uh, playing that role because I feel like Bayonne's trying to be inclusive uh, and can continue to be more inclusive. They put money in the deal that was generated from another deal for a developer to pay into their affordable housing plan because the waterfront is has a great market position. 
So that could be done. And But as far as whether on an other township that could be done, I think it has to be studied. And the state has to have a, a professional or a group of professionals that, uh, that really uh, can understand how these uh, shifts and markets impacts the ability to develop this kind of project, uh, whether it be site conditions or market conditions. And then at that, at that point, maybe you entertain some sort of infusion of subsidy. But I, I don't believe it's a good idea to do that up front because it, then that would mean it's diverting funds from the CDC sector in the urban areas uh, that are meeting voids that either the marketplace or tax credit developers uh, won't touch because the model for tax credit developers is 50 units plus. Otherwise, they are not hitting their economies of scale. That's not what we do. We do the infill, two-family home, new construction, adaptive reuse. We convert uh, churches into special needs units in Union City, uh, the Weehawken border. We've done you know, DDD units in Bayonne. Uh, if balanced housing funds get steered into tax credit deals and to fund co-op developments, the urban areas are going to suffer. Where is the money coming from for the urban areas? Only certain areas have a, a, an allocation from HUD. We're getting a lot of HUD cuts as well. The city of Jersey City has $2 million. What can you build with $2 million if it's 125 and increasing per unit subsidy? Not much units, right? Uh, so those are the issues that, that we're dealing with, and I think that this needs to be looked at very carefully, where the money is going. Chris, can, can I ask you, um, there has been this discussion about cities and gentrification and suburbs and exclusion. Um, where, do we, where do we come down at this point? I mean, if people want to live now in more urban areas, but yet they already have a lot of the lower cost housing, what, where does the state go? Um, we we have 3,000 units in New Jersey. 50% of them are urban. 50% are suburban. Um, most of our urbans have been the classic tax credits, um, redevelopment projects that have taken on a neighborhood. Um, and I, I believe, and I think the other speakers this morning have, have underscored, that there is a need across the board, urban, suburban, um, but I don't think that we should be a state that says it's urban versus suburban. And unfortunately, the policies have really been structured so that it is urbans competing against suburban. And, um, you know, getting back to the tax credits, for those in the room that know, I mean, that's really um, uh, the driving force. And so as developers, we run to meet the point system, um, the, and right now, you know, it's um, prioritized for communities with high-performing schools and transit and a mile from a supermarket. And, and when you start to really layer who those communities are, the first thing you will see is that most of the urbans will fall out at, at the first blush, uh, older suburbs in the second blush, and you're left with a, a, a small amount of, of communities that are really prioritized. And if that's what the state decides, then that's what we all decide. But it's being done without real, I think, conversation. And to, to point out, I thought I would give a real example, too, um, uh, in terms of another group that really isn't being served, and even though we have a lot to do, is, is senior. Well, I'll give a, a senior example. We built um, a senior building in Bloomfield. 50% um, of the applicants were turned away for being over income. And over income was not enough to stay in Bloomfield because Bloomfield's one of those communities that's uh, re you know, uh, redeveloping and they couldn't afford their house. They, um, you know, it, it, it was really sad and they were $2,000 over the limit. I mean, that's really hard when we have to say no when you're $2,000 over the limit. Um, we have, uh, an issue, uh, it'll get corrected eventually, but I thought it was an interest, we just did a study um, in terms of our projects, and with the increase in the minimum wage to 15, um, in some of our counties, a two-person household earning minimum wage will actually be over income. Um, now, they will not lose their housing because under the rules, they're kind of grandfathered in and they're able to stay in their home, but now, the mobility to change for a job or uh, to do anything, they're locked. Because even if a new project is built you know, two towns over, they cannot move from where they are because now they won't qualify in the other units. Now, it'll take two to three years 
for the median incomes to reflect that increase, but you know it's a unintentional consequence of giving people more money, but we've just taken some of the mobility of that additional income out of the system. If I could just chime in, um, Kevin, I totally agree with you on making sure that we have single families moving into more economically thriving communities, because I think we all know what the research says, that when it does stop generational poverty, um, you know, students are more apt to go on to higher education and things like that, but I think another piece of that needs to be that we need to make sure that lower income communities, that we as anchor institutions, so hospitals, academia, corporations, are making true investments in lower income neighborhoods so that they can thrive. And that's something that when we made this shift, we said that we, the only way that we can invest in our communities is to buy local and hire local, which wasn't really a popular choice even internally. <laughs> um, but we knew that we could no longer buy all of our goods from across the country, but we needed to find small, local, minority women and veteran-owned businesses in our communities. And that was, and it's still a process, so we haven't made that total choice now. I mean, we haven't made that total switch um, because, and we had to change our policies and procedures because we couldn't ask, you know, Deanna's marketing shop to make us 5,000 T-shirts and then pay her 180 days out because she needed to make payroll tomorrow, so we had to create a prompt payment policy. And then hopefully in doing that, she'll be able to hire local. And then we made a commitment to hiring local in our communities. So, and we've hired, you know, entry level positions and higher positions and for those entry level jobs, really creating career ladders so that they could move up to the next be best position. And we know that in doing that, so hiring and buying local, we can create sustainability in those communities that we you know, couldn't create before. So that's been a huge change. And I think in doing that, we can potentially stop thriving econ economies and create some of that family, some more um, family homes in those communities. And let me ask, um, a lot of people have asked these kind of questions, and I think Peter brought this up too. Um, things that New Jersey, that maybe might help us, but New Jersey may have some barriers to. Things like the accessory apartments, uh, mobile homes, uh, communal living or community spaces. Uh, is that something that we need legislation to change, or are these viable options, a anyone? I mean, I sit on the housing committee for the assembly, and so we're constantly having discussions, new legislative initiatives, whether or not it's micro homes, whether or not it's you know doing public-private partnerships on foreclosed properties. One of the biggest rubs that people don't understand when we talk one about unintended consequences and disincentivizing communities from doing this sort of stuff is that because of the deed restrictions that are mandated, even for like the micro-sized homes, we recently had a bill that would try to incentivize communities to allow those homes within the communities. However, as currently drafted, it does not help a community offset their affordable housing obligation because it doesn't have the deed restrictions. And so we've made things so complicated and so difficult that you know, we have communities actually in suburban areas that were fully compliant with affordable housing for family units and built everything they needed to build 30 years ago. All of those units now, the deed restrictions are lifting, and so it's as if those communities had never built anything at all and are now finding themselves having to start from scratch. So we need to be able to, you know, if we are going to implement and say, Microhomes could be a great idea for home, you know, starting home ownership or mobile units or any of you know a wide variety of product. Let's at least make sure that they're being counted towards a municipality's obligation, and you know I think that's one of the biggest issues right now. Oops. Another question is. Um, we can take a carrot versus stick approach. 
Um, sh again, should the state be involved in that and should we be using carrots or sticks or a combination? I, I think there's a, a obviously a state, uh, local, and even federal role in, in, in this discussion in addressing the issues. But to your last uh, com uh, question about challenges, where there's a challenge, there's always an opportunity. Uh, really simple. It, this is about three things in my eyes. Lack of funding, land, where are we going to build this stuff, and then public policy uh, not moving at the same speed as the issues and the need in the marketplace is happening. So those are the missing factors uh, to really address this. But lo locally, as I said, there's a debate on how do we deal with these uh, uh, issues of land and money and trying to address the need for most of the Jersey City residents. And uh, when we're running out of space and we can only build up and it's appropriate to build up in Jersey City, you know, it's inclusionary zoning. But then you get into uh, the semantics of what that in inclusionary zoning ordinance should look like. You want to make sure that developers in the strong markets are actually building the units there and not paying some uh, small number, a fraction of what the cost is to build it, that unit. It should be... Uh, if that happens, it should be an actual uh, uh, amount to, to build it. Uh, for example, or from the tax abatement uh, payout that developers can do, if they get a tax abatement, the contribution is $1,500. That's a refrigerator and a stove. I can't build a unit with $1,500. So these things uh, need to be appropriate. Also, uh, my feel, and I, get, and I also get the calls from the middle income uh, 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 either potential tenants or, or buyers who say, it's not fair. I don't qualify for affordable housing, yet I can't afford uh, housing in the marketplace. That's all relative to the individual and where they want to go. And these are the folks that want to still live in downtown that are making the 80 to 120,000 that can't afford the 250 that it takes uh, to pay uh, the $5,000 rent. However, those people have more options. I moved to Union out of Hudson County so that I can afford a home. I have that option. A single family, I mean, a, a, a single parent with two kids earning $35,000, they don't have much options in this region. They'd have to move out of state, go further south. That's not right in my mind. So I think that policy should always look at the most vulnerable. Yes, there is different needs at every level, and some are real and some are perceptional of where you want to live. You, everybody wants to live downtown with the cool shops and access transportation, of course, uh, but it's all perceptional. But the bottom line is for a single mom with two kids making 30 grand, this is not a perceptional thing. This is real life. The kids may not be able to eat. She has to make choices between the rent, food, health care. That, that's where we need to focus as far as our housing policy and uh, the middle and lower class. Kevin? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think to John's point, uh, the, and there's an interesting debate in Jersey City that we're, we're involved in as well between Council President and Le Councilman Lavaro and Councilwoman uh, Waterman and on, on one side and Mayor Fulop on the other about who should benefit from inclusionary zoning. And there's no doubt that the, we need to do a better job in high, high rent places like Jersey City in making sure that these enormous density increases come with very substantial affordable housing obligations and the market can handle it and you know the same developers who will complain in Jersey City that they can't do 20% low and mod are trying to get into do into suburban towns to do 20% low and mod and where the rents are lower and it's you know so it, it's just that they're trying to exploit a, a political setup that has let them get away with doing no affordable housing, and it's not right. Um, Assemblywoman Shapizi talked about Dumont, and a private, that wasn't us, it was a developer that came in and sued them because they, they stupidly allowed themselves to be exposed to a builder's remedy. And if I were a legislator with a district, I'd make sure, all, and I want to avoid builder's remedies, I'd make sure all the mayors get compliant. And in Dumont, which is a town that should have a l and does have a small affordable housing obligation, it is it is a place that um, that you know I, I regret in ways that they left themselves vulnerable. If they wanted to preserve that land, they could have done so, and they could have worked with the Bergen Housing Authority and done a nice affordable housing development. That didn't, you know. But the builder had leverage, and you need that leverage in order to keep towns honest. Um, and so, you know, what I want to talk about is Saddle River. 
two acre zoning in 96% of the town claim their affordable housing obligation is zero. Zero. That is what we need to be outraged about, in my view. And, um, and that's why we need to be able to sue them. Um, and so the, uh, having said that, Saddle River and any of these towns should work with supportive housing providers, should work with Chris and her company, um, but we have to make sure that the private sector that's making a lot of money from inclusionary development is not getting away with not doing the affordable housing they should do. And I actually have a more bullish view of what we can expect from the private sector because um, exclusionary zoning is so bad in New Jersey that the private sector is jumping at the opportunity to do 20 and in some cases 30% affordable housing. Um, and the market rate units in those places are where many of the people who are at 80 to 120% can live. Um, and, and that's also important. If I may just real quick, because I do represent Saddle River. I grew up in Saddle River and um, I, I couldn't afford to move back to Saddle River, nor did I ever feel entitled to do so. But Saddle River is an example of where policy in a bubble makes no sense. You, uh, for what conceivable purpose would you want to build affordable housing in Saddle River that has no public transportation, no jobs, no means of getting around? If you are a family with, who's making $30,000 a year with two kids, the only way you're going to get around is by having to purchase a vehicle, go out of pocket on pretty much everything under the sun with an incredibly high cost of living just by virtue of the fact that there's nothing there. And so if we're going to actually have an honest conversation about this, yes, Saddle River is a very wealthy community. However, building affordable housing within Saddle River really doesn't achieve any sort of social goal because I all you're doing is, you know, it's, it's kind of silly. So, you know, yes, there are other areas that we should be building affordable housing. You have public transportation, you have jobs, you have the ability for that mother to get her children to school and to do various things. You know, Saddle River doesn't even have busing. So uh, it's, it's one of those things where let's have the honest conversation. Let's talk about Jersey City issuing over 37,500 building permits in a couple of year period, many of which were pursuant to pilot agreements and less than 100 units were affordable. That's the sort of stuff that we need to take a look at, not you know some wealthy enclave that has absolutely no resources. Oh. Um, can I ask, uh, this is, uh, we're, we're running out of time. Uh, do you quick? I quickly? Yeah, I just wanted to jump on the deed restriction because I think that's a really important point and pilots. So um, the assemblywoman, uh, and I believe Kevin talked about both. So deed restrictions um, going beyond a 30-year period sounds like a good idea. But from the uh, industry standpoint, at that 30-year point, we need to reinvest in those units. And a lot of the programs historically have said that in order to get in the door for new financing, a lot of federal programs would require that you're at risk of losing your affordability. So you can jump into a preservation of that affordability. When the deed restriction goes on and on and on, we lose the case to say that we're at risk of losing those, um, those units. In terms of the pilot, um, if you're going to extend the deed restriction, New Jersey then has to have a vehicle to extend the pilots. So I know that there are some settlements where the deed restrictions go beyond 30 years, but the developer has no ability to make sure that those tax rates will be within a reasonable rate to keep the units affordable. So right now under long-term tax abatement statute, the maximum is 30. Even under the HMFA statute, it's 30. So in terms of policies that need to be changed, these are really impa impactful uh, issues that have to be addressed. Quick, quickly. Icon. Okay, uh, so Chris made the statement earlier on that it doesn't have to be suburban versus or urban. I 100% agree with that. It really is not about Saddle River versus Jersey City. That woman with two kids making 30 grand, if you put affordable housing in Saddle River, maybe because she can afford a car to get around uh, and benefit from the other uh, benefits that are, are in Saddle River. So, you know, this is discussion is very relative, and I think part of the problem is that, yes, it, everything doesn't fit perfectly for every place. 
uh, and and we got to take a look at what uh, how those dynamics look like locally and you know uh, regionally. But it doesn't have to be this discussion of one ver versus the other. Or so I don't know Saddle River very well, nor I do I know the income uh, statistics. But something tells me that 80% uh, is that Bergen County. 80% of the median income, which would qualify a household, it could also mean somebody making 55 or something like that. Uh, that does have a vehicle that that can get around and maybe wants to put their kids in a good s uh, school system. So I really hope that we all walk away that uh, from this discussion and it's clear that it's not one against the other, but both can be achieved and that's really the formula to building a more thriving New Jersey. Okay, so I'm gonna ask Kevin one last question and then it, we're gonna do our lightning round. Everybody gets kind of a minute to just sum up your thoughts. Um, I, I think Assemblyman, Woman uh, Shapizi mentioned this, and it was one of my questions. At this point, it seems like Fair Share is the only keeper of all the knowledge of these settlements. Uh, we don't have a COA where we can go to and say, "Hey, how many? You know, what's the obligation of Town X, or what are they building? Um, how do people find out what's happening in their towns? What? How do we get a, a number statewide? Is is Fair Share making that um, yep. available or?" Yeah, we have we have much of that, and some of it I just sh I shared earlier. Um, the uh, the state should be collecting this information. The the League of Municipalities presumably has this information, and um, all of it's public information. So it's not it shouldn't be difficult to get. You know, we uh, we just got a request recently from the legislature for the list of settlements. We've we've provided that. So. Um, it is, uh, this is, you know, most municipalities are putting their settlement agreements on their websites. And so um, it's, uh, and our settlement agreements um, and longstanding law require the, the uh, municipalities to prepare monitoring on an annual basis. Um, and we've taken a step further than that and required them, um, and they've agreed to provide it on their websites on an annual basis. And so the transparency that um, that people want on this it is there, and and, and I recognize um, that there is uh, there's an appetite for it, and there's nothing that would prevent the state, just as it reports construction data, from taking that same sort of uh, uh, step with affordable housing. Do you want to um, give us your one minute last thoughts, and then we'll move around the. Sure, yeah, we are, um, we had a horrible time on affordable housing from 1999 to 2015. Um, and uh, that's in part because municipalities chose to exclude and were allowed to do so. And um, that both curtailed the market and um, the, you know, it's interesting in Saddle River, there's actually a developer that's trying to build multifamily housing there. So apparently there's some market there, um, and it, the uh, I, I, I thought conservatives didn't like government regulation, but but it's okay to regulate it when it keeps two acre zoning in place. I, I got to figure that one out. I have to say I'm very happy that it's on the record that Kevin said that they're going to be transparent and that he embraces transparency because up until today, I know uh, both the Assembly Housing Committee, DCA itself, the League of Municipalities, and possibly some other organizations had reached out to Fair Share Housing attempting to get transparency to understand numbers, what was taking place and otherwise. And based upon the communications back, it was we are not going to share any of our information with you. So I'm very happy to hear that their uh, position on that has changed, and I look forward to being able to analyze the data. I think one of the biggest issues that we have had is the lack of transparency in this process with everything being put before settlement agreements. Um, it's the very worst of Oprah and a whole host of other things. And I think that you know, we all need to be able to sit down, analyze what is actually currently taking place in the state, and do our jobs as legislators to set policy on a regional basis approach moving forward. It's something whereby in Bergen County, by way of example, 
we are the most densely populated county. We have very real public transportation issues. We are at maximum capacity. NJ Transit cannot service a lot of our areas to begin with. One train goes down, people don't make it to work. And so to operate within this bubble of let's just build and hope that it all works out, I think is doing a disservice to everybody. There is an absolute need for affordability. There is an absolute need to do it smartly. And we can't shut down conversation by just saying because somebody wants to see something done maybe better or differently that, you know, therefore racial segregation. It's a total BS response. It's something that we need to be honest about and we need to be able to move forward together. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I uh, first wanted to thank the, the audience for coming out, such a wide group uh, interested in this topic. I think we have a lot of lost time to make up for. Eight years of the disinvestment through the Christie administration in urban areas and the CDC sector by the elimination and diversion of the balanced housing funds. They're coming up soon. I hope we don't spend too much time trying to figure this out so we can start building. Same thing goes, in my opinion, for the COA projects. Over a decade of discussion and the amount of units that could have been built have not been built. We need to hurry up and figure this out uh, and make sure that public policy is responsive because at the end of the day, the people that are being hurt is not me, it's not Chris, it's not everybody sitting on this panel. It's the working class residents of New Jersey and they need affordable housing. It's a given if everybody understands that that's the issue, I'm just confused why we're not out there dealing with it. Everybody is either you know, uh, giving its back to the issue or not addressing it. We need to face the issue and address it ASAP. I also wanted to be clear uh, while I'm here on stage uh, that the governor's office and DCA and everybody's involved also understand the importance, importance of the community development sector in the urban areas and that they play a critical role to building a thriving New Jersey. Again, we can do both uh, to meet the needs. Thank you very much. Say that, um, you know, but for uh, the settlement agreements, I do believe that we would still be in a no man's land in terms of moving affordable housing forward. And we may not like it, and I think we see um, the negative side of doing housing policy in the courts. Um, I think it was a necessary evil at a time when there was a void and nobody was really moving it forward. However, I think once you get through this, I still believe we have to go back to an administrative agency. Um, that the planning could be done um, work in a comprehensive way, in a transparent way. I think it's unfortunate that we were forced to be in the courts. And I just want to go on the record that I was chair prior to 99. Um, and so we actually were getting stuff done. Um, I just want to um, echo Chris's sentiments that we need to do this in a comprehensive way. We really need to think about affordable housing, but we also need to think about all of the services and supports that surround affordable housing if we truly want to make sustainable change, if we want to create healthier communities, as well as more equitable, equitable communities. We need to think about the policies that have gotten us here. We need to think about the systemic issues that have uh, created uh, generational poverty and we need to begin to address those. I want to thank all of you for coming, but I especially also want to thank all of our panelists. Let's give them a nice round of applause. And I want to thank Colleen for um, doing such a bang up job. And, she, and she'll be doing all the rest of our round tables for so, but thank you all very much. I want to remind you that the survey is on your tables. Could you please uh, take some time to fill those out and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much.